if that was the case, then Lewis would have killed us, too. We were with duties mostly consisting of ditch digging and hedge trimming. Alexander tried to follow his father's footsteps and take up the family trade, but realized rather quickly that the hard work and measly pay did not suit him. He is also said to have attempted to train as a tanner and become proficient in the process of treating the skins and hides of animals to produce leather. The modernity in poultry wages caused him to become fed up with the profession, but it seems he learned skills that he carried with him into later life. Skills that would not just provide a means of living, but a great deal of infamy, too. Alexander was not like other people. He was rough, ill-tempered, and violent, and felt he simply did not belong around regular folk. So when he met a girl of similar inclinations named Agnes Douglas, nicknamed Black Agnes, due to her shock of black hair, as well as her distinctly dark personality, he knew he'd found a soulmate. Alexander's mother and father strongly objected to their union, having heard rumors that Black Agnes practiced witchcraft. So they told their son that he would be forbidden from living in the family home with his new belle, should they choose to wed. The couple then chose to elope, leaving East Lothian and traveling across the Scottish lowlands, moving from place to place and surviving on what little work each of them could find. But the couple quickly grew contemptuous of their employers, as well as the work they were doing, and one night they hatched a plan to earn some easy money. They lay in wait at a crossroads near to a tavern, ambushing, murdering, and robbing wary travelers as they trudged towards what they assumed to be a safe haven for the night. The couple's dark deeds then took an even darker turn, when at one point during the robbery and murder in Hampshire, they decided on an easy way to cut their costs. Instead of using the money they stole from their victims to buy food, they would simply turn their victims into food by dragging their corpses before butchering and eating them. Alexander was used to dealing with the corpses of animals and found that human corpses were all too similar to the ones he'd worked with during his tanner training. After one such incident, Agnes and Alexander dragged off the body of their victim to a coastal cave in Benane Head between Garvin and Ballantrae. It was there they made a fire in which they roasted the poor soul's limbs, feasting on the flesh once it was properly cooked. The cave was almost 200 meters deep, and the couple discovered that, during high tides, the entrance was almost completely blocked off to outsiders. They had managed to find themselves the perfect home, a subterranean lair from which they could launch raids into the nearby countryside and one they could retreat to after their grisly crimes to avoid being apprehended by the law. The couple lived in the cave completely undiscovered for more than 25 years. Agnes and Alexander raised a family there, producing eight sons and six daughters, who in turn birthed 18 grandsons and 14 granddaughters, all of which were products of interfamily breeding. What began as a small family grew into something that more resembled an actual clan, and as time went on, the Bean family turned their bloody work into an industry of robbery, murder, and cannibalism. They began to strip all remaining scraps of meat and organs from their victims, pickling the leftovers in barrels so they could more easily survive during the harsh Scottish winters. They also employed the rather shrewd strategy of tossing the skeletal remains of their quarry into the sea. The bones then would be washed up on beaches far from the coastal cave they called home, leading terrified villagers to believe that it was in fact animals that were attacking and eating travelers at completely different locations, effectively throwing them off the Bean family's scent altogether. Naturally, the frequent disappearances did not go unnoticed by the local villagers, but the Bean family remained hidden during the day and only ever ventured out under the cover of darkness to claim their victims. Their methods were so furtive that the villagers were completely unaware that there was a group of murderous cannibals living right under their noses. As the years went by, more and more villagers seemingly vanished from the face of the earth. And the more they did, the more the local population seemed to take note. 
Eventually, several organized searches were undertaken in an attempt to find those responsible for the vanishings. During one such search, it is said that a group of men noticed the coastal cave that the Bean family called home, but were unable to believe that anything human could survive in it, and thus failed to properly explore it. But if they had, they would have discovered horrors beyond their imagining. Unable to locate the culprits, the local townsfolk became incredibly frustrated and volatile in their quest for justice. They actually ended up lynching several innocent people, brutally executing them in spite of their pleas for mercy, and totally ignoring their insistence that they were guiltless. They often suspected local innkeepers, since they almost always happened to be the last people to see the victims alive. Several were dragged from their homes in the middle of the night and hung from the branches of large trees nearby. But still, the disappearances continued. Then one night, as a married couple were returning from a local county fair on horseback, the Bean family spied their approach. They ambushed the couple, dragging the wife from her mountain, savaged her as she lay in the road. They then tried to do the same to the husband, but found he was not so easy to be overpowered. Little did they know, he was a former militiaman who was skilled in combat and carried a sword and pistol whenever he was out riding. The husband was able to hold off his attackers, but as he did so, he was forced to listen to the blood-curdling screams of his wife as the Bean family tore into her with knives and hatchets, carving her up while she was still alive. Eventually, after the husband had dispatched a fair few of Bean family himself, a group of travelers who were also returning from the very same county fair appeared on the same trail and were horrified to have stumbled on the grisly scene that lay before them. They ran to assist the former militiamen, chasing the Bean family away with their superior numbers before escorting the newly made widower to the local magistrate to tell them of what he had experienced. Upon hearing of the pure animal veracity of the attack, and how the poor murdered wife of the former militiaman had been carved up and butchered while she was still alive, the magistrate seemed convinced that those responsible for the many disappearances over the years had finally been discovered. With local authorities sounding the call to arms, it wasn't long before none other than the Scottish king, James VI, heard of the horrifying atrocities. He subsequently made the decision to personally lead a search team of over 600 men and several bloodhounds on a quest to find and eradicate the Bean family once and for all. Using clothing from the bodies of the slain Bean family members, taken from the site of the recent county fair ambush, the bloodhounds were able to track a scent trail which led all the way back to the previously overlooked coastal cave at the name head. Using flaming torches to illuminate the cave's dark interior, the king's men found the Bean family surrounded by the spoils of their blood-soaked pillaging. Piles of stolen heirlooms, jewelry, clothing, and gold coins littered the ground around them. What would line the walls of the cave made the king's men's blood turn to ice in their veins. Chunks of meat, human meat, hung to dry from ropes that were strung above their heads. Barrel after barrel was stuffed with picked human organ meat. The smell was enough to turn a man's stomach, but it wasn't nearly as disturbing as the inbred features of the clan that cowered before them. The majority of the family, mostly women and girls, were captured alive and without a fight, and were dragged wailing from the cave by the furious king's men. But many of the men and boys ran into the depths of the cave and refused to come out, barking out that they'd kill any man that tried to take them. Instead of risking their lives to root them out, the king's men placed gunpowder at the cave's entrance, blowing the opening sky high and ensuring that any that remained inside would surely suffocate. Those that were captured were initially taken to Tolbooth Jail in Edinburgh, before being transferred to Leith or Glasgow. There, their captors were extremely disturbed by the family's lack of humanity, both in their physical appearance as well as in their morality. Seeing them as no better than animals, the king's men subjected the Bean family to summary executions, believing they were too inhuman to even warrant a proper trial. Alexander Bean, the family patriarch, was subjected to a terrible retribution for the crimes he had masterminded. The king's men cut off his private parts and burned them before his eyes, a visual metaphor that he would never again pass on his rotten seed. He then had his hands and feet severed, 
Lincoln was made to bleed to death, a slow and painful end to a truly evil man. Yet as he died, he supposedly screamed out, It is over. It will never be over. Hinting that some of the family had actually survived the raid by the king's men. After this, Agnes and the rest of the women, along with a number of the Dean children, were tied to stakes and burned alive. There may have been some truth to Alexander's claims that some of his ilk had survived the raid, as in the nearby town of Givon, there are those that speak of a woman who appeared among the populace not long after the raid of the Bean's coastal cave home. Apparently after being interrogated by the locals regarding her origins, she admitted to being an escaped member of the Bean family, who were by that point infamous for their murder and debauchery. She was reportedly taken to a nearby tree and hung from a bough while a baying mob roared in approval. Over the years that followed, truth passed into rumor, which in turn passed into legend. And these days, there are many who dispute that Alexander Bean and his cannibalistic family even existed. The fact that Alexander earned the nickname Sonny Bean during the time that followed, a derogatory name given to Scots by their English neighbors, there's quite a flimsy argument that the whole story was concocted by Englishmen, simply to give Scotland a bad name. But a remarkably similar account can be found in a book by Nathaniel Crouch, a compiler and popular history writer who published his work in the year 1696. In it, he tells the tale of an incident which supposedly happened in 1459, the year before King James II's death. A passage from it reads as follows. A thief who lived privately in a den, with his wife and children, were all burned alive, having made it their practice for many years to kill young people and eat them. Only one girl of a year old was saved and brought up to Dundee, who at twelve years of age was found guilty of the same horrid crime, when great multitudes witnessed her execution, wondering at her unnatural villainy. She turned toward them, and with a cruel countenance said, what do you thus rail at me, as if I had done such a heinous act contrary to the nature of man? I tell you that if you did but know how pleasant the taste of man's flesh was, none of you all would forbear to eat it. And thus, with an impenitent and stubborn mind, she suffered deserved death. What's clear from this testimony is that even if some of the details have gotten confused or twisted over the course of the centuries that followed, there was indeed a family of cannibals up in Scotland, maybe even more than one. A family that didn't just eat human flesh because they were forced to do so out of poverty, but because they actually enjoyed it. Here's an honest way to make yourself $1,220 or up to $4,880 per household and get to be vaccinated first by a major pharmaceutical company. The trial is filling up fast. Don't miss this opportunity. wage as a dentist in the southern Russian region of Stavropol, while Anessa held down a full-time job as a nursery school teacher. Their combined income was considerably higher than most Russian households, and they made sure their 13-year-old daughter, Victoria, wanted for nothing. On the surface, they seemed as normal and well-adjusted as any other family, and often went on camping trips to the nearby area of Rostov. Yet one of these seemingly wholesome family outings, something dark and primal was driving the trio, along with two of their in-laws, to commit some of the vilest acts a human being is capable of. On February 17, 2008, in Oksai, a small town in the greater Rostov region, Anissa, Roman, and Victoria pulled up outside the home of Mikhail Zlidnev, head of the Information Security Department of the State Drug Control Service. With all the efficiency of a military raiding party, the family smashed their way into the house, 
quickly incapacitating Mikhail and his wife with shots from firearms they had concealed in their vehicle. Once they were downed and incapable of defending themselves, the family took their time butchering the couple with knives they carried, making sure that Mikhail was forced to watch as they carved up his beloved wife before finally finishing him off. The family then went about collecting trophies from the house, items that would serve as mementos of their first hunt together, including items of clothing and a television remote. The trio believed that such a horrendous act of violence might sate their desire to hunt and kill, and that afterward, they could return to being pillars of their small Russian community. But the raid only fueled a bloodlust that would lead them to claim many more victims. It only took a few months before the family was banged for blood again. So once again, they got on the road to Rostov for another one of their supposed camping trips. It was July 17th of 2008 when Alexei Sazonov and Julia Vasilyeva were traveling on a federal highway through Oxay District. It was a routine drive for them, right up until bullets began smashing through the windscreen of their vehicle. Alexei was killed almost instantly and Julia was seriously wounded when their car veered off the highway and crashed into an embankment. All Julia could do was watch while dazed and bleeding as Roman, Inessa, and Victoria approached the car, wrenched open the doors, and took yet more trophies in the form of a purse, a driver's license, and a passport. Evidently, they wanted something to remember what their victims looked like, but in their haste to flee the scene, Fearful that other motorists would catch them in the act, they neglected to finish Julia off. She turned out to be one of the few survivors of the murderous clan. Somehow, the Podkopaya family was able to wait an entire year before they felt the inclination to strike again. On July 8, 2009, paratrooper Lieutenant Colonel Dmitry Chudakov was sitting in a parked car on the shoulder of a stretch of highway, along with his wife, their 11-year-old daughter, and seven-year-old son. They were on their way back from a family holiday and had stopped briefly to rest before continuing their journey. Dimitri was awoken and a fearful cry from his wife had him opening his eyes to see Vanessa approaching their car. She was shouldering a powerful semi-automatic shotgun and pointing the barrel directly at the car's windscreen. Dimitri was no stranger to violence and immediately reacted, trying to gun the car's engine and get his family out of there but no one can move faster than a bullet, and as Anessa pulled the trigger over and over again, scores of shotgun pellets ripped through the glass and tore through Dimitri's body, as well as that of his wife and small son. Eleven-year-old Veronica was the only one left alive. She had been sat behind her father, and his body had absorbed most of the shotgun's blasts, leaving her with only scrapes and nicks from the ricochets and flying glass. But she was also completely and utterly shell-shocked from the sudden eruption of violence and barely fought back as Roman and Victoria dragged her from the back seat, plunging a knife into her almost forty times to extinguish her young life. Once the entire Chulukko family was dead at the roadside, the Potokopayevs looted their belongings, stealing an expensive laptop, a hair dryer, and a digital camera. It should be noted that they happened across almost $1,500 worth of gold jewelry in the Chodokov's luggage and neglected to take it. They were killing purely for sport, not for any kind of financial gain. This is entirely at odds with the Russian media's description of them as bandits, as they were not robbers who just so happened to kill to make their tasks easier. They were murderous psychopaths, killing for the sake of killing. The fact that Dmitry Chudakov was a high-ranking officer in Russia's elite VDV paratroopers made this particular set of murders front-page news all over Russia, and the authorities were desperate to quickly find the perpetrator. This led to a completely innocent man named Alexei Serenko being falsely accused and convicted of the murders, which ended up with him spending two years in prison. The only evidence levied against him was the hastily gathered results of the ballistic examination, and as the owner of a similar kind of semi-automatic shotgun, Alexei was erroneously branded as the Chudakov's murderer. Alexei was also accused of killing three other people in the same area based on the same ballistics evidence, but after further examination, 
he was cleared and released from prison, with the Russian government only offering him meager compensation. The following year, the Podokopayev family planned another bloody attack, and this seems to be the first that was motivated by actual financial gain. Manessa was aware that the family of her goddaughter were in possession of a number of high-tech firearms, as well as a considerable amount of cash, both of which could be used to carry on the campaign of rapacious terror. The Podkapayas drove out to the home of their prospective victims under cover of darkness, lying in wait for them to come home from eating dinner at a nearby restaurant. Yet the only two people who returned home after quite some time were the family's two daughters, one of which was just 12 years old. Both girls were grabbed up, held down, and tortured in order to force them to reveal the location of both the weapons and the stash. One of the girls was said to have their eyeballs gouged out before she finally broke and told them where the money could be located. After somehow finding it in herself to kill her own goddaughter, Anessa then led her family on a murderous rampage that lasted four long years. The killings mostly consisted of home invasions, much in the same style as the first set of killings that the family committed. But during that time frame, the Polkapayevs also developed a new style of attack, one of which they would ambush those who responded to burglar alarms that they had deliberately set off. On September 19, 2012, in Novacherkos, the family killed two employees of a private security company who responded to alarms going off at a local dental clinic. The Podkapayevs then stole the security guard's firearms, which included a Kalashnikov assault rifle and two semi-automatic pistols, all of which were used to replenish their arsenal of weaponry. Then, on April 8, 2013, the family unloaded hundreds of rounds of ammunition into the car of grocery store employees responding to alarms that they had set off at their store. Miraculously, only one of the men died, with the driver somehow surviving the vicious attack that should have easily snuffed him out. After five years of intermittent killing and looting, it seemed the Podkapayevs were unstoppable in their slaughter. But on September 8, 2013, unsatisfied with shooting a husband and wife couple who were out on a stroll in Oscar countryside, Roman and his daughter Victoria decided they would rob the home of a former military officer. They didn't find any cash in the residence, and so they made the rather bizarre decision to steal candles and chicken drumsticks, apparently being completely unwilling to leave empty-handed. The father-daughter hit squad fled on the scooter that they had previously stolen that day, and were soon pulled over by police officer Ivan Shakovov. Ivan was investigating the shootings that the Podkapayevs had committed earlier on, and demanded to see some identification from the pair. Instead of showing any documentation, Roman pulled out a pistol and executed Officer Shakovoy at the roadside. What followed was a run-and-gun battle that ended up with Roman being shot dead and Victoria arrested, while Anessa was later taken in custody whilst guarding a huge cache of stolen weaponry which included silencers, grenades, and dozens of ammunition cases. Police also found dozens of items belonging to slain victims among the weapons cache, proving that the Podkapayevs were responsible for their murders. During the interrogation that followed, Anessa told an investigating homicide detective that she hated police and lamented that her family was not able to kill more of them during their murder spree. A shocking revelation also brought to light the fact that the Pokopayevs were being assisted by Anessa's sister and brother-in-law, who happened to be a former policeman. Since he was connected with law enforcement, the brother-in-law was able to pass on inside information regarding police operations and movements, which enabled them to escape justice for such a long time. But what would drive a former nursery school teacher, one that was apparently capable of such nurturing instincts, to describe herself as a gangster by nature. What could possess her to view herself as some kind of hero for targeting military men and police officers? She was certainly worshipped as one by a handful of anonymous sadists. As not far from the site of the Judokov murders, police officers found three homemade knives on which were written the phrases to my beloved bandit girl and to my beloved Amazon. A reference to the warrior being a legend. It's a bit bizarre driven to violence and thievery out of a desire to simply survive. But what's absolutely horrifying about the case of the Polkapaya family is that they chose to kill because 
Satan's an hideous, evil desire to dominate and destroy. Because hunting, ambushing, and killing human beings was what thrilled them more than anything else. They didn't need the money. What they needed was the blood. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click the notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you've got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and give and receive feedback from